thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess just since we just were talking about wet meadow restoration, um, Fish Park is the project that we're talking about. There's only about 11 inches of precip annually. So um, definitely drier than what we were just talking about. Um, so this area in red here is Fish Park. Um, that's where our project was. It's on the Utah Colorado border um, and west of Grand Junction, about 7,000 feet in elevation. And, um, so in this area, it burned in 99 in the Wrigley complex fire, and then it burned again in 2006. And um, essentially, this area was used by sage grouse before the fires, but now there's really not much, not much sage in there at all anymore. Um, and so we kind of wanted to look at different ways to restore some of that sagebrush. Um, this is a range monitoring photo on the left from 1988, and the one on the right is from 2016. So as you can see, there used to be a lot of sage out there, and there is not anymore. Um, so some of the things we wanted to look at were just the limiting factors for um, sagebrush restoration, and then the, the factors that can be affected by management we, that we looked at were competition with other plants, uh, water, and herbivory. And so in order to look at competition, we uh, did both herbicide and mechanical treatments. And when I say mechanical treatments, um, what we actually did for our experimental plots was we um, took, went out there with a hoe or a McLeod and basically cleared the ground to kind of simulate um, what mechanical treatments would do if you had a piece of machinery out there. Uh, the herbicide we used was Rodeo, so glyphosate. And then we had two different kind of water-related um, experiments. One was supplementary water, like a polymer gel, um, and then we also put little microsites like wood piles on the southwest side of our plots uh, to see how that would do. And then we also caged some of our plots and um, then we had sagebrush seedlings or we put out sagebrush seed. Um, and the seedlings, both the seed and the seedlings were locally collected and then brought up to the Meeker Plant Center and either the seed was stored or the sagebrush was grown out from that locally collected seed. And then we planted either with or without forb seed. So um, a lot of different treatments going on in these experimental plots. So this is just a photo of putting in the supplemental water. Uh, this dry water company that we used, the, the first year they actually went out of business. So the second year we used a polymer from um, the state forestry. And you can see in this photo, how we sort of installed it next to that seedling sagebrush. Uh, and then also, this is just a photo of a cage. You can also see in this photo the microsite on the back side of that cage that we, we just had locally collected uh, wood that was from the burn site that we piled on the southwest side of the plant. So um, these black squares are experimental plots. The little green uh, shrubs in this picture are um, sites that we just did sagebrush seedling planting, and I'll get to those later, but for now we're talking about the little black plots. Uh, and so essentially what, what we did was we monitored these areas for three years, um, and we had a total of 20 different plots, so potential combinations of all those different treatments within each of our um, treatment areas. And there were 60 plots in each treatment area, so about three of each potential vari variant in each of these um, experimental areas. So, uh, and, and we also did just the, took the existing vegetation. And at the same time that we were doing this, there was actually a fire on Dog Island, which is quite a bit lower than our experimental sites, but um, it was kind of 
Nikki noticed that there was uh, recruitment of um, sagebrush just naturally coming in at this location. So we sort of used it as a comparison to see what, um, how our sagebrush seeding and seedlings was doing relative to natural regeneration post fire. So just a table of the, um, the results that, that seemed to be significant. Seedlings definitely did better than seed. Um, and extra water actually compared to the microsites really didn't make that much of a difference, which to me, um, I found that to be one of the more interesting things about this because the microsites were relatively easy to create and hauling um, water and polymer out to these sites is quite intensive and takes a lot of coordination. So, um, and then also just areas treated with herbicide had better growth than areas that were mechanically cleared. And then caged seedlings had higher survival. Um, this, interestingly, we did not actually observe any herbivory on our plants, caged, uncaged plants. Um, so that might actually just be because uh, that cage provided a little bit more environmental protection as opposed to actually herbivory protection. And then one thing I forgot to mention also is that um, these sites, this is just wildlife herbivory. We didn't, we fenced out um, cattle for these experimental plots. Um, the rancher up there is, has organic status. So for obvious reasons, we didn't wanna expose their cows to, to the herbicide. So it's just uh, wildlife herbivory that we were looking at. Uh, this is just a table of the difference between the survival over a year from seedlings and from seed in the different exclosures. So you can kind of see that there's, um, obviously from seed did not do very well. Uh, lots of zeros up there. And then also you can see that there's a difference between the exclosures and I'll get to that in a minute also. So generally this, this chart here has it split out between the, the five plots and also herbicide and mechanical. Um, generally there was more growth in areas treated with herbicide um, as opposed to those that we just cleared. And again, this is kind of an arid site. So it's possible that by doing our mechanical clearing, we were also sort of um, removing some of that, um, I guess uh, the nurse plants that were sort of protecting the seeds and seedlings. And then um, survival was generally higher in the cage plants. So in this one, the bars, the sort of hashed um, next to the solid bar, that, that represents no cage. And then the solid is the cage. Okay, so what's up with number four? This is actually a picture of plot number four, and I'm sure most of you will recognize that that's a lot of cheatgrass. Um, so essentially plots one and two were, were dominated by crested, and plots three, four, and five were dominated more by cheatgrass, um, and with full, plot four having, having the most cheatgrass of all of our sites. So basically um, what we got out of this was the you know, seedlings are, are worth the effort, but they do need to be protected. So planting the seedlings is about four or five times as expensive on an acre per acre basis than, um, than putting out seed. But given that we had almost no success with our seed and, you know, um, 40% success with our seedlings, uh, it certainly is worth the effort, at least in these arid sites. So the other aspect of our project was just recreating habitat, trying to create these sagebrush islands in this area where, where the sage really didn't seem to be coming back. And so these are these little green 
uh, shrub looking icons on this map. So we planted about a little over 500 sagebrush um, in five locations, again, around Fish Park. And these were not fenced. Um, and we, so for these, we basically just were trying to do what we thought would work best. So we caged each individual seedling. Um, we put the dry, the supplemental dry water out with them because at the time we thought that would be the most successful thing. And then we also put down a weed barrier around the, um, the sagebrush. I will say the site's really windy and the weed barrier did not last very long. <laughs> um, that was not a good idea. <laughs> so here's just a picture of the, uh, us filling some buckets for the polymer this, when we went back and refilled those, those little black tubes for the supplemental water. Um, so yeah, just we had a water tank on the back of a UTV. Our fire guys came out and filled one of those big water tanks um, and we just were going from plant to plant filling these. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty labor intensive for sure. Took a lot of coordination and a lot of, a lot of folks helping. So this is our um, survival on those islands. Uh, our overall survival was about 40%. And then, like I said, for the comparison for, for Dog Island, the survival was 46%. So we actually feel pretty good about how our planted sagebrush did out there, considering that the natural regeneration had about 46% survival. And then this is just the survival by season. And then um, you've got on the precipitation uh, by month there and the black line is the average. So of course, actual was more variable than average. So, um, and then overall, survival was pretty good, we felt like, for, for our sagebrush seedlings. Um, and then the next phase of this is, will those sagebrush seeding islands become sort of fertile islands? So the idea was that they would increase the seed source and slowly expand out and hopefully um, contribute to more sage in, in the fish park area in general. Um, and then I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, this, this was actually published in the Journal of Rangeland Ecology and Management in 2021. If anybody wants to get into the details, um, you can find that one. So I said Meeker Plant Center, it's actually the Upper Colorado Environmental Plant Center. Uh, is the name of the, the place that, that stored the seed and grew out the plants for us. And then the Western Colorado Conservation Corps provided pretty much all our labor for our initial planting. Um, it was great to have that help. And of course, all the Grand Junction and um, McGinnis Canyons NCA staff uh, that helped with all the monitoring and the, the follow-up work 